You're listening to the Veteran Etc. Podcast, as there's always more to be said about a veteran. Join your host, Mike Kim, a veteran, ex-monk, season war trauma therapist, and writer, as he shares his years of research in veteran readjustment culture and the meaning of warrior life. Now, here's your host, Mike Kim. Veteran Etc. This is a show focused on veteran culture and veteran readjustment culture. I'm your host, Mike Kim, and I've spent years studying veteran culture and have developed the concept of veteran readjustment culture. Basically, I look at the contributions veterans have made into the daily life of veterans within community. This does not rob the veteran from his or her own experience, but if anything, amplifies that with others. So I take a look at the books, the movies, the different personalities, the different events that are tied to the veteran experience, the lived experience. That experience that just doesn't unfold without a design. One that is uncovered as one engages that veteran military experience. So I offer an audio essay. And this essay is focused on Dakota Meyer and his drama interpreted from a philosophical perspective. I give that interpretation. And in no way is this a personal attack. And please know that any information that I might share on this audio essay is part of the intellectual property tied to Veteran Etc., a show under the umbrella of Coming Home Well, And so please respect the content. If you are going to use the content, please credit the show. Now, let me begin. Dakota Meyer served in the Marine Corps and was deployed to Afghanistan in 2009. At this point, this was his third deployment in the global war on terror. He was deployed twice to Iraq. And on his second deployment in Iraq, he ended up getting called up to be part of an embedded training team, an ETT in Afghanistan. And on a mission, September 8th, 2009, Dakota Meyer would experience hell on earth. He would be part of one of those historic, tragic battles in military history. Out of all of this, Dakota Meyer receives the Congressional Medal of Honor. He is unique because it hadn't been some 38 years since another Marine had received the Congressional Medal of Honor. And one of the few Marines who received it and is still living. Dakota's bravery speaks volumes of the Marine Corps, and it also speaks volumes about the human being, Dakota Myers. We are caught up by the Medal of Honor ceremony where President Obama had presented the medal to Dakota and his family. We're also reminded by Dakota marrying Sarah Palin's daughter, Bristol, having some internet feuds with folks like Dan Barzarian, a professional gambler out in Vegas, some other veterans, some civilians who use tactical gear and might not have served or might not have the experience with that tactical gear. 
Dakota has had some run-ins with different people, and this has made Dakota Meyer seem like just a spectacle. I want to remove that. I want to take out the spectacle of Dakota Meyer's mystique or persona. Dakota received the Medal of Honor because he disobeyed orders and rescued Marines, Army personnel, as well as Afghan military personnel. He made five trips. And let me correct myself. It's not that he disobeyed the order that got him the medal. Disobeying the order was a highly thought out, or how should I say, high level of thinking that inspired Dakota to pursue rescuing military personnel during an ambush in the Battle of Ganjagal near the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. Dakota's disobeying of orders intrigues me. And I guess unconsciously, I said that that was kind of the reason why he got the Medal of Honor. But that's my own personal wish. See, I think that when you wear a uniform, you have to be like Dakota Myers in many ways by thinking through your actions in the middle of danger, being ethical. Being ethical counts most during those extremely difficult times when others are at risk or when you are at risk or both. It is in the ethical that, in my belief, truly shapes the culture of the military. In other words, ethics is not just doing what's right as you're fulfilling your particular role as a soldier, if you're looking at things from a military ethical perspective. Now, the pioneers of military studies, they looked at ethics as part of military professionalism. And so in military professionalism, you've got two, two big schools, pretty much the two scholars who started intense research on military culture and military bureaucracy study, or the public administrative study of the military is combined with the study of military culture and also the study of war in the context of the American way of fighting wars. That's, that's part of the military studies that I understand it to be. As one who studied the military studies at Norwich University, the Military College of Vermont, I was exposed to learning several different approaches towards understanding the military. One of the big schools was started by in Huntington. He wrote The Soldier in the State in 1957. At that time in 1957, and I believe 1981, 1981 is the last time the book was renewed. So let me explain this. Huntington is able to present a, a concept about military professionalism from the days of the mass armies of like World War II, World War I, Civil War, to the volunteer army, which in the early 70s became the new model for the American military. The latter model had more of a eye to American civilian society. And prior to that, prior to the volunteer army and during the time of the draft and all that, because the draft isn't just during the Vietnam War, it's, it's before that. In World War II, there was a World War II draft. Korea, even peacetime Cold War years, and there was a draft. So American men had to serve in the military. And there were waivers and exemptions, but generally, if you're of adult age, you would go into the military and serve. That changed with the all-volunteer army in the 70s during the Vietnam War, or because of the Vietnam War, actually, because of the civilian influence on government and ultimately the military to create major changes. This is important because that means ethics to a certain extent are influenced. So Huntington's position is that the civilian world and the military world are two separate worlds, but because we live in a democracy that the military submits to the civilian authority. At the same time, the civilian authority allows the military to focus on what Huntington calls the primary mission or how he describes the primary mission 
for the military leader, the military professional, and that is to manage violence. He says that the military leader needs to have the skill, expertise, and commitment to manage violence. And that that is a very unique type of professionalism, and it's unlike any other. In other words, it's very different from being a doctor and, and living up to those ethics or being a, a lawyer. The military ethic or military professionalism, I should say, military professionalism, has a, a particular kind of way of doing things that shouldn't be, and that shouldn't be interfered upon, or how can I say intruded upon? It shouldn't be intruded upon by politicians. Politicians need to kind of stay in their lanes, according to Huntington, while the military is just focused on safeguarding the nation through its focus on being a functional fighting force. You've got the other school, and that is led by Morris Janowitz from the book, The Professional Soldier, written in 1960. Now, Janowitz has a different perspective. Janowitz thinks that, or he claims that the United States is a republic, and because it's a democratic republic, its goal, ultimate goal, is to protect the rights and liberties of its citizens. And so the military is an extension of that. The, the military engages the larger civilian world, the larger society to develop as society is developing or how society becomes self-actualized in its own ways or actualized. The, the military also has that. And I find that quite interesting. So there isn't this military all on your own, let's get focus on just defending the country. Actually, with Janowitz's theory, being involved with society is an extension of de developing the, the proper professionalism to seek a victory, to gain a victory in the battlefield. Or how could I say it? That's, that's Huntington's perspective, that you've got to be uh, military, manage violence, to gain the victory in the battlefield. Janowitz is, is, has a different focus. And, and like I said, it's, it's more like engaging society, the, the military, combat stuff, all that preparation and training, that, that'll come, that'll fall in line due to the budget and because of the bureaucracy. So, but to enrich the, the organic culture of, of the military, it's, it's important to be attuned to the larger society. And again, that's to protect rights and liberties and also to honor and protect the republic, the American Republic the Constitution based from the Constitution. I say that because I think whether you're looking at this narrative of Dakota Meyer or you're looking at the narrative of, let's say, General McChrystal, you can look at the different influencing frameworks that might have you think deeper about what is happening in the military. It's interesting because when you look at the Dakota Meyer story, there's drama, but I see something deeper. I actually see, in a way, the merging of the two dominant schools of military studies. I see aspects of Huntington in Dakota Meyer, and I also see aspects of Janowitz in Meyer. What do I notice? I noticed that much of Dakota Meyer's guilt or his expressive, guiltful narrative, I think, comes out of a certain frustration with what he experienced in Afghanistan. You see, at a certain point, Dakota Meyer, he was so trained up, so prepared for this battle from all his, uh, all his pursuits in military education, as well as performing Marine Corps warfighting skills in training and in his garrison life, barracks life. The thing is, Dakota Meyer shows the expertise, skills, and commitment that Huntington talks about in regards to the American military professional. I also see that Dakota Meyer showed aspects of Morris Janowitz's thinking because he could disobey an order because he was doing the right thing. And I think that 
in American culture, we've got a lot of problems and inconsistencies, but one dominant narrative within the American life is standing up for your truth or for your convictions. And so Dakota brings that to the military and on September 8th, 2009, on that tragic day, the Battle of Ganjigal. You see, Dakota was able to identify the failures of his command, of his superiors. He was on the ground requesting their support and indirect fire, but his command often would let him down in delays in giving bureaucratic excuses for not deploying those extra firepower assets. This, this becomes a problem for Dakota, and he struggles with that. You see that, especially in the interviews with Jocko Willink, episode 277 and 115. Whether you like Dakota Meyer or not, I think it's important to appreciate his courage, not only to face bullets, but his courage in doing the right thing. And I think that in American society and in military culture, in military life, it's stressed upon to do the right thing. I just wonder if a lot of folks enlisted and advanced leadership officers know how to do the right thing at that particular time of the difficult situation. This makes me think about my monastic years when I served as a Dominican friar and we had to study medieval philosophy. Medieval philosophy, a la St. Thomas Aquinas, leads you to Aristotle. And with Aristotle, you've got the basis for much of Western thinking. When you're looking at Aristotle, the way his philosophy is applied to human beings, to individuals is and, and groups, basically that you're to live out life and try to find the mean, to find some middle ground instead of going into extremes. And that involves a deep study and that involves a deep ethic. And that's where professionalism comes up. Military professionalism comes up. I think there are a lot of people who talk about military professionalism, but actually it's my professor at Norwich, Dr. Jim Toner, who develops the concept of the American military ethic, but from a virtue Aristotelian model slash Thomas St. Thomas Aquinas influence model. And this hybrid model of, of St. Thomas's thinking, as well as Aristotle's thinking, is to help military personnel make difficult decisions, deal with difficult decisions, a situation by situation basis. This isn't taught in many military programs. I know I've been in the military. I was stationed in Iraq. I deployed to Iraq. I was part of the Cold War military. I was part of the war on drugs. I wasn't Miami Vice, but I was still exposed to much of that war on drugs culture because of my military service and the Iraq war. I think soldiers, whether you are that one army soldier who just walked out of his fire base and into the Afghanistan village and was, was captured, Bergdahl, whether it's Bergdahl or it's Dakota Meyer, and, and I use Dakota Meyer in a positive light in this, whereas with Bergdahl, I, I question, and I don't condemn, but I question his situation. I'm saying that we should be looking at folks like Dakota Meyer, instead of reading a book by General McMaster on ethics and seeing like what happened in Vietnam, where leadership just became focused on their own agendas and wouldn't communicate. Well, my thing to McMaster is now what? You can study those errors, but now what? And I think using the case of Dakota Meyer and his way of thinking in regards to seeing an immediate need and addressing it from a virtuous perspective, from an ethical perspective. How do we get a deeper understanding of this from a military perspective or um, from military books instead of just pulling out Catholic moral theology on, on just war theory from Aquinas? What we can do is look at some of Jim Toner's works. I would start with First Faith and Allegiance and the book American Military Ethic. 
I think these are two great books that will help you understand what I'm trying to push my message. Actually, the book is called True Faith and Allegiance. So I think Toner uses true faith and allegiance and emphasizes the true because it's a calling towards military personnel to examine their faith and allegiance towards their country. And the rest of the title of the book is The Burden of the American Military Ethic, something to that effect, The Burden of Military Ethics. I can appreciate that sobering the burden because it is a burden. There's a price to critically think to use your mind in the military, it's easy to just focus on a rule or on a regulation. And this is what Dakota Meyer didn't do, but this is what people in the tactical operations center, the command, parts of the command there, a representative of the command, those who called the shots for those out doing missions on the ground. And so when we look at Dakota, let's not be so harsh to judge him because we have to recognize that there was major failure to support he and others on that mission. And he carries that. So it's not just the burden of facing bullets and RPGs and witnessing the carnage, but the burden present for Dakota is the burden of action. He had to go against his command and perform these heroic acts and not something that he was seeking to do, but he was seeking to be ethical as far as being the Marine that he was trained to be, the Marine that he was training himself to be as well. And so the command, those officers, those leaders, senior NCOs have to understand that not only do you have to keep your weapon clean every day, but I think you need to keep your military mind clear every day. And you have to do that maintenance regularly, like reading, like pursuing educated, scenarios in your trainings that are going to involve complex situations. It seems as though Dakota Meyer, the staff sergeant in the Marine Corps, was doing more than folks with a pay grade way higher than his, with a rank way higher than his. And we should learn from that. And we should, as I've been doing, bringing back the past with these military studies thinkers, one who I'm familiar with, who catapulted me in academics in a major way, James Toner. Dr. Toner and his book, True Faith and Allegiance, gives the military personnel, the person and military personnel, whether you're in combat or not, a, a systematic type of approach towards your behavior in the military, whether in combat or not. In some way for that situation in Afghanistan, Dakota Meyer was able to put it together, be creative, be be courageous, be wise, be self-control, self-manage, self-led, be just. Those are the virtues, the Western, those are Western virtues, the major Western virtues in philosophy. And according to, to Toner, again, an Aristotelian, he says that you can, and this is in more of his later books that he talks about these, these virtues, but in True faith and allegiance, there's talk about the virtues, but but the virtues have to be, and, and this book was written in 1995. The military professional must recognize the customs and traditions of his particular unit, as well as the larger unit he or she is part of. Military professionalism also involves understanding the laws, the rules and regulations, not just you know, the local customs, but what are the local rules and regulations? And then the big ones that are tied to like the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. This actually guides the ethic and it's a source of great controversy. And then the last two parts in evaluating one's behaviors during duress in a military situation, during ethical dilemma in the military, whether in war or in peacetime. You're looking at the outcomes, what the the outcomes, and you can even have a, a sense of solid projected outcomes. But what are the outcomes of your behavior? By Dakota Meyer disregarding those orders and going back, he made an impact as far as bringing back bringing back bodies, helping the wounded. He really made a positive difference out in the battlefield, and that that was his outcome. 
So that nuance ushers in the last part of Conor's evaluation, and that's the circumstances of the situation. And that would be where one can look at Dakota Meyer's actions on that day of September 8th, 2009 in Afghanistan, and, and just say, look at his circumstances. There, there was no air support sent for Dakota and other folks who were tied to the U.S. military, as well as military U.S. military members. What are the circumstances? So Dakota Meyer disobeyed an order to do a higher good. And that's what I would say the other ingredient to Morris Janowitz's theory that you've got to military professionalism also involves doing for the common good. So that's the big reason. That's one big reason why I think Dakota Meyer is a son of Janowitz's school of, of military professionalism as well as Huntington's. And his situation makes me think about the larger military and how they can value the teachings of Dr. Jim Toner, who's basically saying, you can evaluate yourself out in the field, heavy combat, light combat, walk in garrison, barracks life. And you can use those four things, customs and traditions, laws, military laws, the outcomes from your actions in your role as military person in each of those situations. I say all this because much of the time we talk about those who do the right things and those who don't do the right things, but we don't take a deeper look into what their circumstances are. What have they ultimately done with their behaviors and how did their behaviors fit that are over those particular individuals? And what are the, the customs that they follow? And are they tied to a higher level of professionalism? In other words, you can't be like an OnlyFans and be an officer in the military. I would even say an NCO. I mean, I would say I'm sure there are OnlyFans folks from the military, but I just think that something like that would, would go against the customs of the military, especially being an officer. And I'm not, I'm not being rigid. I'm just saying that clearly it doesn't embody the core trait, one of the core traits, and that's discipline as far as being a military person, being in the military. So just pointing all of this out provides a good reason why we should make military personnel and veterans deep attempts to understand on a deeper level, instead of just giving binary comments. As we approach Veterans Day, let's look at how we were in uniform as professionals, as military professionals. And now as we're veterans and no longer wear the uniform. And if you're listening and you are wearing a uniform, a salute to you. But if you're a veteran and since we're approaching Veterans Day, are you also in your post-military life, living an ethical life? It's just a question I pose. There's no right answer, but there's something very important when coming across Jim Toner's book again. Jim Toner is not only a, a former professor at Norwich, but he ended up spending much of his teaching career at the U.S. Air War College and also at the Army War College. He's written a lot of, a lot of books. Check out his books. I think what fascinates me about Toner is that unlike many of the other scholars, I, I would say maybe Lieutenant, is it Lieutenant General Dubik and his book, Just War Reconsidered. I mean, out, outside of Dubik, it's it's Toner. And I think Toner was saying this well before Dubik. And Toner gives you, he gives you some practical tools to use in uniform and out of uniform and in garrison life, if you're still in the military and not in war. Yeah, those four approaches towards a problem, an ethical problem, measuring the customs and traditions of what you represent the laws you follow, the military laws that you're bound by, the actual tactical and strategic outcomes. And in barracks life, your your productivity and wellness in the barracks. What's your status on that? Your military health as well as your own human health. And the circumstances in your situations, in your day-to-day -day situations, what are those circumstances? And making a distinction and making decisions from looking at all these things towards 
the good. They must be towards the good. This is what Dakota Myers did, and we can learn from him. But at the same time, I bring out the writings of Dr. Toner so that we can look at Dakota Myers' life while he was in uniform, and then after as a veteran and the challenges that he experienced instead of just calling him a media nightmare. And so happy Veterans Day. Again, I say this and let's make a difference and let's remain positive. Again, if you use any of this content, please give credit to the show, Veteran Etc. Hosted by Mike Kim. Veteran Etc. invites you to join us again with your host, Mike Kim, every Sunday. If the content from this podcast is informative to you, please share the podcast with others. Give a like and or post something you learned from the episode on social media. If interested in other truly informative podcasts like Veteran Etc., check out cominghomewell.com for a listing of other veteran-based podcasts. Thank you for tuning in.